Welcome everyone to episode 198 of Just Joshing. I am your host, Joshua Pentelaresco. I write stuff and podcast too today. My guest is Elizabeth Witten. So I said this to her uh, privately. I'm going to say this publicly here. I thought personally with the Aurora Awards that the toughest category was young adult. I thought there were some amazing young adult stories uh, of Lee's Exo, Susie Vidori with, with the West Woods, Jane Bernard with her Maddie Hatter series. Um, there were some really, really loaded books. Elizabeth Witten blew me away. Um, just because I did not expect that book to be as powerful as it was. It really really came out of nowhere it definitely made an impact so much so that she went up there and tied a nebula award-winning author with the aurora and she deserved it she really really deserved it and i know if she's listening to this she's probably tearing up a little bit but i'm going to say this like this you deserved it you deserve to be there. You deserve to win. Anyone on that list, that category, could have won, and I would have bought it. They all were amazing books. But you deserved that chance to be there, and you deserved whatever comes your way next. Um, so, as you're going to find out, Elizabeth is one of the very sweetest people you'll ever find um, in this conversation coming up. Uh, but as a result, I just I had to say that here because I got to talk about me after this. So let's get to the actual conversation, and you'll just hear from me more afterwards. So, so it's better than me clearing my throat all the time. Cool. <laughs> it's, uh, it's okay. I, I can edit some of that up. Some of that up. Not all of it because you know, naturally speaking, if it's a natural part of who you are, yeah, it should be there. Oh, okay. Okay. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Yeah. I turn the recorder on. Okay. Anything incriminating you like to say, make it good. <laughs> okay, and we can go with Whitten. Elizabeth Whitten. Elizabeth Whitten. Yeah. Okay, so. But that, I will mention that I'm also Elizabeth Krakowski. That's right, she has two identities. Which one is the real one? Only time will tell. <laughs> How you doing? Good. How are you? You got here? Raining? Yeah, it rained on me just as I got off the bus. Is that, oh, you were on the bus? Yeah. That's why I was a little bit late. So. You were the bus? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it, it's just cheaper. Like, I can go, like, the city, the city's bus drive, the bus service is good. Not great, like, compared to, say, Toronto and Vancouver. So is Toronto. Both, they, they, they suffer from the same problems. Bad infrastructure, but amazing transit, right? But if you look at here, it's it's transit like is competent. I wouldn't say it's great because they don't have stuff like C train going to the airport yet. Yeah. They don't have stuff like that that they really should. They really should have that, definitely. Right, but th- this is not a city that thinks about its infrastructure very much. But yeah, it's an education sitting on buses. Like um, most of the most of my work is like I when I worked in accounting or something like that, I would take buses to work, right? So, and the most interesting things would happen on buses. And you know, you get just the slice of humanity, and it's, you can just sit there and watch the whole time, yeah. and get so much sort of so much stuff for your writing. It's great. Well, I, I said the last train ride I have to write down somewhere someday. Yeah. So I was on the last train going home, yeah. and so there was this giant of a man. He was skipping on the on the bus. Oh, he gets, he gets he not on, on the train. It gets. Oh, Get, this get this gets wild. Okay, this okay. this gets wild. So there's other gentlemen on the other side of the train. So on the train with with bags of cans and other paraphernalia, we'll just okay. say. Yeah. And I, shopping carts. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, no joke. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. And then and then I realized after about one stop, looking around me, that I am the only thing on this bus, or sorry, train, that's legal. <laughs> gets better. So, uh, I, at around 39th Street, so I'm heading back to Sports Downtown. Okay. 39th. This gentleman comes up. He's a, he's a little younger than I am. He looks around. He goes, he takes out this little plastic bag with, like, drugs in it. Goes, Matt, so the guy that was skipping comes towards him. 
right? And, and they start talking. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this thing. So are you scared? Or are you like writing this down for your next novel? I'm neither. <laughs> Cautious. <laughs> Cautious. Cautious. I'm, my family's from Detroit. So. Oh, okay, so you're wise. <laughs> not, no, I'm, I'm actually not. I, I just, there's some basic things, you know, you know just keep your awareness at all times. Don't, don't be, um, don't pull it unnecessary attention to yourself in situations like that. Yeah, so but just note to self, writing, like, writing down while on to the <laughs> train line, bad idea. People, okay. pe- pe- people tend to look at you kind of strange. It's like, why are you writing this down? Anyway, I left the train at uh, City Hall Station. The, the, the drug dealer and the big guy were, were, were cuddling. Oh! I, 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 I trust <laughs> I, So, I left at that point. I didn't. I could have gone one more stop. I decided that that was my stop. Um, just because... You just didn't need to see anymore. <laughs> I, I've already seen too much. So, yeah, let me... So, that's, so, you can have, like, that. You can have... I've seen... Uh, last night, I was going home from work. I saw a uh, homeless guy. He was t- asleep on the back thing of the bus for about. He was asleep when he woke up, like literally two stops before I got off. So I mean, it's really interesting to watch the dichotomy of what goes on in any strand of system, none- nonetheless. But uh, in this city, it's really interesting. So. Well, I'm really glad you braved the Chad system to come here and do an interview with me. I'm very honored. Yes. <laughs> It's no big deal. It's like whatever. It's like I, I, it's what I do. So. So Josh, I know this is supposed to interview me. That's okay. But I'm really interested in you, and I would like to know, like, so you've just been um, nominated for this, this Aurora Award. You're a finalist, right, for yeah. best uh, fan-related work. Fan-related work. So, how do you feel about that? Surprised. Yeah. Uh, I didn't nominate myself. I didn't put myself down for so nominating. Someone did that. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so I, I didn't expect it. So literally, I'm, I'm minding my business and I get an email. It's like, dear Aurora Award finalist. It's like, wait, what? This is a joke, right? You click on it. Yeah, isn't it? You just go. No, well, what? It's even more so with me because I didn't even put myself down for anything. Oh, so you didn't even know? You yeah. had no idea. No, like not. Oh. None. So you just got this this email. Yeah, I just got this email, and, and then you're just like what? Yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it. I uh, so I've already kind of I already I already kind of look at this already, yeah. like I've won, because it doesn't matter if I win the award or not. I was nominated for what I do, and now yeah. people agreed with that to put me to the finals. Uh, and that's a huge, that's huge a huge honor. Yeah. You know? And it's also validation. I've been doing, like, as of today, episode 187 will be coming out later on today. Okay. I've done 187 episodes. So Think that means it. you've been doing this for three years. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I've been listening to, like, some of your podcasts, and I, like, you know, I'm kind of impressed. You know, because I listen to CBC, I listen to all those podcasts kind of shows and um, I think the last one that I listened to was Tracy Davis yes that was a fantastic fantastic movie. like it started so funny like the Barbie with the Barbie three way <laughs> T- T- Team Kelly <laughs> Oh yeah, so that was that. So I was listening to that. I was snorted coke out my nose at that. But then it kind of like progressed to this very um, you know, she kind of really opened up to you, and it was like so um, authentic and so real. And I just thought, wow, like you're really good at it. Like you really do have a talent. At it. And I mean, it was nice for her to open up, but also you allowed it to kind of happen. So. When I made the decision to do, I've been doing interviews for 15 years. Mm-hmm. So when I made the decision to do this podcast. Mm-hmm. I wanted it. I had some things in mind when I when I yeah. set out to do it. The first thing I wanted to do is I didn't want to do a standard question and answer interview. And more than most part, no, they yeah. are not question and answer. There are exceptions. Some people don't like to talk, and that's when the, that's where questions are yeah. useful trying to get them to open up and do stuff. But if you notice, if you see and listen to enough interviews, I don't generally ask a lot of questions. Or if I do ask a question, it's a very organic question. Yeah, that just can, you know, things can grow from it or grow from it. And I kind of actually don't mind that coffee sort of background. 
because it kind of makes it feel even more just like a, a normal conversation. Yeah. And so that kind of makes it feel kind of special too. Yeah. Well, so it doesn't feel cool or it doesn't feel. No, I, I would I I would like I mean I have to up, I have to upgrade I mean that's just that's mm-hmm. inev- that's an inevitability but I mean I don't mind actually going to all these yeah. different locales. This is the other thing too. This is about what makes whoever my guest is comfortable. Yeah. If we're meeting in a coffee shop, we're meeting in a coffee shop. If we were meeting in like uh, a convention, we meet at a, we're gonna try to find a quiet room in a convention and we sit there, we chat and you know, that's kind of the uh, goal. But the idea is I'm not interested in your books per se. Not that I don't like to read. I'm interested in the person. So if I'm gonna do that, that means I have to be willing to open up and listen and not judge and that's a very big and it, even in real life now I've been finding that more people have been opening up to me about things yeah. sometimes, sometimes good sometimes bad sometimes let's call them a column like just different yeah. stuff and you recognize like some of that stuff I have no idea what to do with but I also recognize it, it just comes from the fact that, by and large, and this is something I just realized, people can trust me. And I don't take that lightly, you know? No, and you shouldn't. No. Yeah, because, like, it's kind of scary to come to a podcast. Like, this is my very first one. So you're just I, thinking, why is it what scary? if I say, well, if I say something stupid. So you say something stupid. Yeah, I do. <laughs> well, actually, I say something stupid a lot. You know me, you'll know that. But also, you know, or what if I don't say anything, or what if I get nervous and I can't talk? And so, um, but when I was listening to your uh, your interviews, your podcast, I realized all the people they really relaxed, mm-hmm. you know, and they just really it just flowed and talked about themselves, like uh, Calvin Jim. That was an awesome. Yeah. I really enjoyed that one. Yeah, there was yeah. about for about 15 minutes. I mean, he was very, he was very, like he was grabbing. Collected. Yes. And then, and then, and then, then we, just, I just found what broke the ice with him. And when I found it, we went down there, right? Yeah. There, there for people, people have their own stories. So I mean, the other, the other part of that equation is, okay, what's their story? What's interesting? Not every story I, I hear airs. Yeah. But the ones that I'm hoping are area are at least some indication of who that person is. Yeah. That's the goal. And you know, I, and it's a half hour to an hour conversation, and you hopefully come away with a sort of a better understanding of who that person is. And hopefully, I'd encourage you to read, do art, listen to music, go to a comedy show, vote. Right well, there. Yeah, like Calvin talking about. Yeah. You know, the Japanese folklore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like that is really, really cool. Right? Yeah. Like, My favorite stuff with him was I understand kind of that feeling of not having a, a place. Like, my, like he feels. Right? Well, he, he's. Well, he was talking about the fact that he's of cultures. Yeah. But he's not. He doesn't fit in any yeah. one particular spot. For me, I have moved around so much. Okay. I just. I have a very different perspective of how things work because I've lived in so many cities at so many different points. But don't you think that's the, that's the typical thing about a writer or someone in the arts? Just just sort of sitting outside of the mainstream just a little bit so you get that different view that most people Some, don't. So, sometimes. Like, I, I, everybody's a little different. Like, um, some people some people are very, very much a product of, of where they've grown up. But for me, I didn't grow up in any one spot. Ergo, I don't have the connection that a lot of other people do. So I'm always, in that sense, I'm always a bit of an outsider. But I'm, I don't mind it. Like Calgary, like just to give me an idea. I mean, I am coming up on ten years in Calgary, which for me is like that's that's the longest I've lived anywhere. Wow. But, all right. So people that have grown up like here their whole lives, it's like. How do you do that? It's like, well, it's just the way it worked out. And I mean, hell, I, who, who's to say that I'm going to be here another time? I might be gone tomorrow. I hope I'm not gone tomorrow, but it could happen, you know? And so, but so that's where me and him, I kind of, like, that's, I understood a little bit of that feeling yeah, with him. Yeah, outside, kind of. Yeah, I, I, yeah, no, I, I, I got that very much from him. And uh, like I said, I w- and Calvin, if you are listening to this, I wish you the absolute best of what you're pursuing. But I mean, that's and that's the other thing too. I get to I get this other cool thing is everybody else gets I does 
you wrote a book. I know how hard that can actually be, right? And and the journey is sometimes not in so much the creation of it here, but getting it out, getting it to print. I mean, um, so I had my very first like self-published project was a comic book. It took me five years, and that was a lot of life happening during that five years. When I got to the end of it, um, I, was, I was really proud of myself. But yeah, so it's just a comic. Yeah, I only sold about a hundred of those. I didn't care because I did it. I, I were this is something when I was living in Arizona, I wanted to do while I was there, and I just I couldn't do it there. It was it was very um, backbreaking, like for me at that point. But the fact that I actually got it done, it's like holy crap, I did it. And so I don't take lightly what anybody does. The fact that they're willing to go out, do something, yeah. put it on a limb. I admire that. Yeah. No, it's been a journey. Writing a book Yeah. a journey. Especially if you want to get it out into the world. Yeah. Yeah, the funniest thing to me is the people who really love to write. And this is generalizing, so sorry. Your listeners don't fit here. A lot of times they're very sensitive. You know, and it comes with observe you know, they are open to observing, they're opening they're open to other people, they're open to experience it, they put it down and it's very sensitive. And then they're in a sort of industry where you're rejected continually. Oh yeah. yeah. It's rejection, rejection, rejection. It's a, it's a sort of very painful. I think you almost have to be sadomachistic or whatever. You have you have to I don't know, because it can be a lot to take. Oh absolutely. absolutely. And I yeah. Absolutely, but it's so I had I had an agent interested in my work. I sent it to them. They rejected me. Yeah. But I recognize this too because I I know them personally. It's not personal. Yeah. Right. And that's 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 just something that once you understand that. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, there's still moments where it's like, oh, that sucks, or oh, yeah. it's this. Yeah. But you understand. It's not. It's yeah. not a. I hate you. Your work sucks, and you yeah. suck. It's no. This for whatever reason. This doesn't fit right now. And I have so had that experience. Yeah. Like, um, so I, I've been in the I've been in three of the uh, Nikma French anthologies. Mm-hmm. So, uh, first of all, just just um, Justin Acton. He's a member of the Imagine Fiction Writers Project, which I belong to. So he decided it would be really cool if we if we could put together if he could put together an anthology that would have writing from people in our group so that some people would get the first chance to get their work published. And he just did this out of the goodness of his heart, you know. This is quiet guy, sits in the background and he made it happen. And then people edited for free, like Lewis Peters, Renee, um, Bennett, those people, lots of other people did the editing for free and then gave people their first chances and that happened to me. So I wanted to give back. So I volunteered to um, edit the last anthology. That's the one that Onward? Um, yeah, and that was uh, Onward, and that was um, Chris, who took over from acting, Chris Pong. Yes. And um, so I did, anyway, the point I'm trying to get to you is, so we're getting all these stories in, and I mean, I've been rejected so many times, hundreds of times, a hundred times. I've sure been rejected for various things, I've written a hundred times. So, but I've never sat on the editor's side. So we're sitting there, we read all these stories, and, and some stories I get, I'm just going, oh my goodness, like, where's, there's no plot, there's no character, I don't understand. And then some you get, they're just so amazing. So anyway, we're sitting around a table, we've all read these stories, and we're trying to decide which ones are going to go in the anthology. I, like, we had to turn down some that were so amazing. We're so, the, the people were so incredibly talented, but we maybe didn't include them because they didn't exactly fit the brief, which was a, kind of a challenging brief to be positive, but people managed it, but some of them didn't fit the brief, or um, some of them, they, they just need a little bit more, or maybe we had too many stories like that, so we didn't need another one like that. And it was heartbreaking, I mean, there was one, we rejected, and I was just saying, I, I can't believe we're saying no to this. Like, it's so looking good. And I'm, so I'm sure I don't envy the um, rejection letters that um, he had to send out. But 
you know, he's, we said, yeah, tell this person, tell them to go to on spat, tell them to do somewhere else, just to do from here. So when you get that thing, it wasn't the right fit in your rejection letter. Yeah. It actually could mean that. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. it, it, no, it, so yeah. Colleen Anderson uh, asked me to do um, and thing for Allison Bound. And it didn't make the final cut. I mean, I made like two, like, I was like one of the last 30 some odd stories. So, I mean, I, I went pretty far, but she had to let it go. She told me, she, this is what she told me in the rejection. Publish this. It's good. It's just, I can't use it, and I'm sorry. And that's literally what she said. So, I mean, that's probably the, I mean, most, not, that, that's the most upfront. The nicest rejection I've ever gotten is Tesseract's. It was so nice. That was like... I'm afraid what the yes will make me feel like, because I actually feel really good about this now. <laughs> yeah. That was such a beautiful rejection. Yeah. I'm going to frame it. Yes, yeah. I know. No, but I mean... But, but they, you know, the editors, they, they love seeing talent. They still have seen something good. And they don't want to discourage you, right? Like, well, we know, yeah. but, but, but that's yeah. my, but my point is, like, yeah. you, like, you're, like, no doesn't, is not no forever. Mm-hmm. It's just no for right now. Look, I, I'm going. I'm look. I'm looking at the. I'm looking at the Aurora. I'm like, well, when I go out to Vcon, I'm gonna be like, well, then I am going. I'm going. It's like there'll be publishers there. There'll be agents there. Why not have something ready? Why not just go for it? And if nothing else, I get no. But I mean, the other, here's the other thing about no. I mean, really honestly, if I if I get a no, whatever. Nothing. I had nothing going in. Right? I'm saying that I believe I am good enough. I mean, seriously, I believe I'm good enough to be sold. That's what I'm saying. I. It takes a certain audacity to actually say that. So I had the audacity to go. You know what? I think I'm worth it. And they might go, Yes, you are. They also might go, Uh. Uh-uh. But either way. Right, I, I literally come in. I literally come in with nothing. So if I get a no, I leave with nothing. I haven't lost anything really. Our reactions are entirely different. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, and then I oh, so I'm not, and so then it's like fetal position for a few hours, suck my thumb, then it's like get some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying. I'm, I'm happy with it. But yeah. yeah I, but I just one of those situations. I understand. You. Ne- this isn't. This is. Think of it like baseball. This, the, the writing is like baseball in the sense. No one bats a thousand. Right. I might be able to get to the point. I might be able to get to the point where I can bat 0.967. That's actually possible in writing if you're if you're well known and you're really successful and people buy your stuff. Stephen King doesn't get rejected that often. He still does, but he gets, but he doesn't get rejected that often. If I bat 0.110 in writing, that's still a pretty good average in writing, right? Because that's pretty better. much anything above zero, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly right? right. So I swing at the bat every chance. Everything, every time I think I can do something, I swing at the bat because honestly. Here's the other example I've used in previous podcasts. Nicholas Cage. Okay. Nicholas Cage made a career of just taking chances with all the roles he did. Some movies were really good. Con Air is a fun movie. Yeah. Some movies really suck. Eight Middle Millionaire sucks. And some are somewhere in the middle. But if you look at his average, his batting average, he has some home runs, he has some singles, he has some doubles, he has some triples, and he has some strikeouts. Right? But he has a career. He has a career. He exactly, a career. exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I care. Yeah, it sucks when I get a no. But it's not the end of the world either. I just did it. That just means, you know what, back to the batting practice, just take another swing at it. Yeah. That's it? No, I kind of like, I don't think I will ever develop a thick skin. I'm not that kind of person. I'm not a very. I'm sensitive that way. Um, but I've started to just get a more, I guess, fearless attitude. Like, like just do it. Just do so, it. So, yeah, send it out. Native. Yeah. So you, you can't read reviews. 
I'm not probably going to read reviews. <laughs> no, no, I, you can't do it. No, you can't. You no. can't do it. Because I hate reviews, so, and they're bad. Like, it's like, ooh, especially when they're right. Oh, I, that, that's, the, that's, yeah. that's the part that's like, I hate you, you're right, but I hate you. But you also recognize, too, that not every review you're going to have is is going to be a positive one. Some people are going to hate your stuff. Yeah. Now, how can anyone hate someone like me? I have no idea. I but yeah, no, but something's wrong. With you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's not you. It's them. It's totally, totally. And, and but it, it's one of those things yeah. where I mean, you got like you're putting yourself out there. So not everything you're gonna do is going to be well received by everybody. And honestly, it shouldn't be. Here's what worries me. It's not that if you like it. It's not if you hate it. It's that you have nothing. Exactly. Exactly. I don't care either way. It's like apathy. Apathy is the worst reaction. Yes. Like hate it, love it, whatever. Apathy. What you know? That's the story. Yeah. That's the one you don't want. No, it's yeah. totally. It's totally not like. I always think of Howard Stern when it comes yeah. to hate. So they did, they did, way back in like the early 90s, they did statistics of who listened to his show. The people that liked his show listened to it for about an hour to an hour and a half. The people that hated his show listened to it for two hours. Average. He made his career off the people he pissed off. And that is brilliant. Yeah, yes, it is. So, so I mean... The guys, people like me, that, like people like me that, can, that enjoy a little bit of him. I'm more of a half hour with him, but that's that's neither here nor there. Um, I don't make him that much money. I mean, he appreciates it because he, he wants you to good. But people that really, 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 really make his day are the people that go, I can't stand this guy. <laughs> so I, when you look at that, it's like, so if I piss everybody off, I'm a mid more money. Yeah. That's a very positive answer. <laughs> <laughs> I really like it. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, you have to, you have to look at, yeah. you have to look at it, right? Yeah. I mean. I think like editing the last anthology was was really really good for me. Like I haven't ever stopped querying or stopped sending it in, things in. But this that just gave me a perspective I really needed. Yeah. To understand that that's the way it works, and you just keep trying. And the other thing too. Try to be an agent's friend. Don't just query them, because yeah. they get chased all the time, yeah. like all the time. Yeah. So like research them a little bit before you. Well, I just research. You know, hi, I'm Josh. Nice to meet you. Yeah. What are you up to today? How's your kids? I uh, like. I mean. So try that, which is what you're good at. Establish a relationship. Yes. Yeah. Because that. As soon as you have a relationship, you have a way to talk to them. Well, then, then you can go like this. Hey, listen, I have something very interested. And they're not going to be as, I, I hate you. No, I'll, I'll, sure, that's what I do. Because I'm now your friend, right? But also, it's just, they're people. Agents, publishers, you know, editors, they're people. And it's really easy as a writer to forget that. Right? And if you forget that, they might, if you're really good, yeah. it's in their best interest to help you. But we're talking J.K. Rowling or Stephen King good, where they might have a license to be dicks, which, by the way, neither of them are to the people they work with. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, if you're not one of those people, if you're not one of those people, it might be good just to have some human decency. It really goes a long way. You know, I think if you are one of those people, it's good to have human decency. Yeah. I don't think it's ever good not to. I went to, like, um, so, I went to Roots Collide this year, which is really fabulous. Um, and just a shout out to Randy Mitchell, like, yeah. like, what he's done, like, for the writing community in um, Calgary over the past like, five years. Like, like yeah. we're on the map. Yeah, I know. People know the writing community. It's, you know, a large to do with that talk about Yeah. And, you know, so it's, it's becoming something, I think. But anyway, Adrienne Aker, she was the former editor, acquisitions editor for Penguin, right? Yeah. And now she's um, her own editor, and she would be a fabulous editor <laughs> to have. But um, she gave some, some talks. And um, 
she did one on, you know, basically the publisher's point of view. You know, what they're looking at. And it's very different than, say, art, uh, not just art, because they only have so much money to sink into a writer, right? Like, when we sell our book, you think, oh, we get this advance, so we should earn that advance back, and everybody will be, that's not true. They, just the editing alone, got thousands of dollars. So they're putting thousands of dollars in editing to and then they're putting marketing to right? And they're, you know, giving those resources, book covers. Um, they pay for interviews, they pay for reviews, they generate buzz. And all that stuff costs money. And they don't have, you know, infinite resources. So when they're looking at you, you're an investment. Your book is an investment, right? And if they choose wrong, it can have detrimental, you know, detrimental effects, you know, on their business. So the thing is, it's a business, you know, and we're coming at it, or some of us with these soft hearts. And, Here's my beautiful book. I just want to share it with the world and hope someone will pay me. And they're looking at it like, you know, we've got Amazon bringing down our neck. We're competing with everybody else in the industry. We have to, we have to do what's going to bring us return on investment and maybe an author that we can build upon, right? And you can have. I read this. Oh, I can't remember the name of the book. I I ordered it. And anyway, it's about the uh, publishing industry. And I, she had recommended, so I ordered it. And there was this chilling account um, about this one woman's writing career in towards the end of the book. And it just made me think. This woman, um, she started writing late. She was uh, she started writing um, crime thriller novels, right? And her book, she her book was bought, and it and it did well. So then they wanted to do a series, and so she um, she agreed to that. She started writing a series. So she was like in her 40s, and then she's moving into her 50s. But anyway, um, she's talking to a newer author, and she finds out this newer author has a great big budget, a marketing budget. And she goes, well, it's my marketing budget. And it turns out they didn't really have a marketing budget for her. Because, and so she said, well, so she talked to her agent, and she said, what's going on here? Why am I not getting a big marketing budget? I've been with this kind of, you know, with this publisher. My books have done really well in the past. And her books were doing well, but not as well as the first one. It was just kind of, but they were still selling and stuff like that. And basically what happened was, publishers, uh, some marketing manager kind of decided, felt sorry for her, so he decided to explain it. The publisher decided to go with a younger writer with sort of who was fresh and new and they felt, you know, that they would put their marketing dollars on that writer who wasn't even established because, you know, they thought the chances of getting better return on their investment would be greater. And then also another problem was her agent wasn't, say, coming by every day pushing her and saying, remember my client and, you know, establishing these relationships with, with the um, publishers. So, so all of a sudden, her career was kind of deep sixing, and her books were being marketed, even though she was an established author within this press, right? And so, I think what happens is, as an author, you have to really understand it's a business. Absolutely, and you have a shelf life. And, and you have a shelf life, they, and you need to really be proactive about your career. No, 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 no. Yeah. If, if, let's say, I get a big five deal. Yeah. Let's say I, let's say I do. That happy, happy day. Yeah, happy, happy day. <laughs> I'm on the clock. Mm-hmm. That's the reality. No, again, it's not, and it, publisher probably would be great, yeah. agent would be great, all of this would be great. I also just remember this too, I worked for, I worked for an author, I watched what happened with him, I watched what happened to a lot of, even some authors that I've known like have had a full career with this. Yeah. There's a shelf life, there just is. So you have to recognize the fact that, okay, right this minute, I'm hot to trot and blah, blah, blah. But that's today. Tomorrow, somebody else will come along. And that, and, 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 and you know what? That's the way it should be. It should always be that way. What can I do while I'm here that when this time is done, I'm still active in my career? Because And the beautiful thing about today is, we are in like the era of a hybrid, where someone's a hybrid yeah. author, right? And 
let's talk about a great interview you did with Craig DeLue. Yeah, yeah. Like, that was a fabulous interview. And I think he totally has handled it right. Yeah. From what I can see. Yeah, no, that's it. And you want and yeah. you want that you want that balance of going back and forth. Yeah. There's gonna be times when you're not gonna be in this big de- in big demand. And that's fine. Establish your niches, establish what you want, the stories you want to tell while you are in that big time. And so, find your audience. Yeah, and find your audience while yeah. you're there. Exactly. That way that way when the, when that time is over, you can continue with a career. Yeah. And who's to say up the road they won't have you back. It's just it, like it, it, like everything else, right? It's just to stay in the game. Yeah, yeah. To have a profile. Exactly. So that when the next opportunity comes along, you can take advantage of it. But if you are going to sit back and be passive and think your agent is going to look after all your... No. That's not necessarily true. If you're lucky enough to have an agent. Well, like, yeah. well, well no, like, I, like, uh, I'll probably annoy my agent. I'm like, <laughs> get them, be like so, because I'll be like, so this is what I'm thinking. And they'll be like, yes. No, no, for the love of God, no, right? And, yeah, yeah. It's like, but that's, but and that's kind of like the thing, right? Why? Even just with the Aurora, I just, I look at this as an opportunity. Yeah. Right? That's what I, I see it as. I don't, I don't, because again, recognition is great, and I'm, and I'm greatly appreciative of that. But I'm also like, what can I do with it while I have it? You know what I mean? Yeah. And. Yeah, and I kind of, um, I really needed that, that nomination, because I was, um, I mean, it, I was not expecting, <laughs> when I, like, like you, I knew I was nominated, but when I opened that thing, I was going, oh, here it is, the rejection. So I opened it, and then it said, congratulations. Yeah. And I did, I screamed, I ran upstairs, my kids were like, what's wrong, Mom? what's wrong? And they went, we don't live, we don't live. And, they, and then I found it, and they were, oh, that's great. You know, so, but it made me realize, okay, I got an opportunity here. You know, I got a little bit of wind here, and I, I have to make use of it. Yeah. You know, for as far as it goes, because in October the awards are handed out, and then it's next to your country, right? Yeah, well, yeah, there, yeah. And, there, and there's that, and there's also the fact. I mean, I've certainly got enough interviews to go well into the rest of the year at yeah. this point. I mean, but I'm also looking at okay. What can I do with this when this is over? And yeah. I've, I've already got ideas for that. Yeah. Uh, it's like because you have to, <laughs> you have to move forward. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> I put it on my book. Yeah. I right away. I said, Brent, Brent, we have to do something with my cover. Brent Nichols. Yeah. Yes. My cover guy. Yes. Yes. He's, he's like my cover guy and my therapist, and, and also the person who makes fun of me a lot. He's quite a. He's, Hi, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> He's a really, he's a very talented guy. No, 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 he really is. He's up for an Aurora Award, too. I've already interviewed him. Yeah, for his book. What's it? I, I don't remember. Something sun. Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry, but. I don't remember. I'll talk my head. up for an Aurora Award. Vote for him. No. But um, there's lots of great people up for Aurora Award. No, yeah. it, but no, actually, it's hilarious. So my, my Brent thing is, I, I, I snuck in a little homage to one of my favorite Pulp series. He's yeah. like, which Pulp series? John, Car- John Carter Mars. I approve, carry on. That was his exact response. I approve, carry on. Yeah. And then I have someone I know from Arizona going, woo! So yes. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, so my favorites, by the way, are John Carter, Tarzan, Doc Savage, and the Turbo Fighter. Wow. Yeah. So I, I like well, that. John Carter. John Carter's awesome. Oh yeah. Tarzan, I have a real soft spot for. I, I know, I know that my book series, The Watcher, the My Watcher series. There's definitely a little Tarzan riff there. Um, Doc Savage just because he's awesome, and Magnus because I love the concepts Magnus talks about and deals with very much. So, cool, yeah. yeah. So your process for writing? Do you do you listen to music? Yes. Like, does it inspire you? Like, what, what place does that play in your? Uh, it it moves. It's that kind of gets me into like a zone. Um, so it, it varies. Like this one, this one in particular right now, I'm listening to. The other cool thing about being a podcast and interviewing so many people, yeah. you get lots of free stuff. Oh. So. Oh shoot. So, I didn't bring you any free stuff. It's okay. Okay. That's okay. I don't ever. I don't no, ever no, ask. that's okay. I'm yeah. Joking. So so. I can so, give you a buck. Okay. <laughs> so it's okay. So. She's bribing me, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways. Okay, um, I'm back to you. So, so I interviewed a 15 year old pop singer. She sent me her album. She actually sent me her album. Yeah. So I'm listening to that right now. So. She's got an amazing voice. So who is this possible? 
Sophia Evangelina is on the podcast right now, okay. and and uh, she's 15 years old. 15 years old. Going on going on 35. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not. She has her head so put together for her age. I mean, and that's great to her mom as well, because her mom is there with her the whole way. Which is good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. yeah and um, but no, I mean, I interviewed her. And I was like, why well, can't? I, I, I'm serious. I've seen people 30 that don't have it, like don't have that switch on. The, I gotta do stuff now and make it have things happen no fear and it's like I dig that about you and you're going to be very frustrated with people like I am sometimes <laughs> but um, but it's like that was an, she was an incredible image she sent me an album so I'm listening to that I'm listening to I generally go I generally listen to lights on a regular basis her music's very very um it's not very. It's not very. It, it, it doesn't. It, it's. It's got to be. It's catchy. She's a good singer and all that stuff. But it, there's. It, there's just something very relaxing about listening to her. That's really really fun. So I'm listening to that. For this particular story, uh, Mariana's Trench Astoria, the pirate, the pirate novel, uh, not novel, novel, the pirate album, because it it definitely applies to this one. Um, I'm writing about pirates in space, so I mean, I might as well. T- Love that gender match. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, genre match. Well, well yeah. and the other thing I'm listening to, oddly enough, is Rainbow Road N64 theme because the whole idea for this novel came about from the idea of actually that the N64 Rainbow Road. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I raced it once. It's like, you know, it'd be really cool because there's a star in the middle of this thing. It's like, what if you race inside a star? That'd be a really cool concept. So I have pirates, a race inside a star, and I got like... So yeah, it's going to be, it, and the reason behind it is actually very, almost environmentally friendly, believe it or not. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'll have to read that book. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. and so it, so, so for this particular one, and the last one I listened to is uh, Finger Eleven's Five Forget Lines. It's very uh, doorsy, is what it is. Yeah, Doris, it's very Dorsey, but the song that really, really applies to it is God's Speed, which is very much all about racing along the highway. Well, Star's not a highway, but it might as well be in this particular Highway to the top. Yes. <laughs> I kind of like, for me, music is super, super important. Like, it's crazy how important it is to me. Uh, and I, I'm, it's pretty eclectic. Like, uh, with my, plug for my book, Houses of My Blood, um, I listen to uh, Silver Sun Pickups all the time. When I could have my sister loves them. I love it. So I, I just, that's all I listen to. I listen to both the other. Weirdly, Stabbing Westward <laughs> from um, the 1990s. They're like one of my favorite bands. So you might as well have some similar CD taste, okay? Yeah, so yeah, it's totally eclectic. Um, once I was writing for one of my short stories that I, uh, that were in one of the anthology, um, actually the one that's up for the Aurora, the uh, Calling, which is all oh, so much fun to write. It was about vampire, a vampire to a dentist to vampires. Anyway, that one I listened to this really good cover of Nirvana, Heart Shaped Box. And I, I was really, really stuck at the end of the story. I couldn't get it written. I couldn't make it work. I couldn't get the right mood. And then I just came across this cover of Nirvana's Heart Shaped Box. And it was by this girl named Piki Wai. And it was just so hauntingly beautiful. And it just nailed the feeling from me. So I'm finding, and I noticed a lot of authors now, like if you go to their website, everybody has playlists now. Oh, and, yeah. You know, it's, it's really become like a really um. It's fun. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a fun. Um, yeah. It's a good insight into the mind of the creator, or like what you're listening to yeah. to get get things. For me, it's either, generally speaking, it's Lights, Diane Birch, or um, or something, or or an old standby for me is Avril Lavigne's Goodbye Lullaby album. That album. Is, I love Avril Lavigne. Yeah. I, think she, I, I really think she's great. I no, no, she's very very talented. But that album in particular yeah. is kind of where I am in my life at this moment in time. Yeah. There's that's part of it. Really yeah, 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 because it, it's the fact that okay, so some there's this part of me that's just like fuck it, let's do it. Yeah. And then I don't give a shit anymore. But there's another part of me that realizes I still care. I, I care. I care an awful lot. And and there and, and there, 
as you listen to the whole. So it's like this tough vulnerability. Well, well, no, well, it's not. It's not even. It's not even. It's not even tough vulnerability. It's just the reality is when you get older, you just you, you get sick of the. You get sick of um, seeing the same bullshit over and over and over again, and you, and you know it's bullshit, and you're tired of it. But on the other hand, you still want to make a difference. You still want. You still want people to go for it. You don't. You yeah. still care enough that you want that and that's where that album that's what that album that's what that album actually is for a lot of you have to stay a bit vulnerable or else you become cynical yes and then cynical you might as well be dead yeah because it's the death of all things cynicism in my book well cynicism is my least favorite human emotion yeah me too Um, like which is why I like YA a lot because everybody goes what do you like about YA what I like about YA is Lack of it doesn't matter what's going on in any of the stories that I've heard. The, the protagonist or the characters, they're never cynical because they're not organized. Uh, they can, I don't know. They, 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 they can be, but here's the thing about a young adult book. There's an emphasis on growth. Like, yeah. like, like a character is going to, at some point in the story, evolve. Yeah. So, the, 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 you might yeah. have a cynical character when they start. But there's hope. There's hope, and that yeah. hope. And what? Yeah. And what you do? And the really cool thing is, it's almost like. So my favorite, my favorite young adult book is Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. I love that because it shows Harry at both his most vulnerable, and also at his most adult. Like the entire series. The fact at the very beginning of the story, when his family is poked and prodded by that by that one family, he loses it. He just loses his temper, yeah. flashes out, right? It and <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's a completely yeah. understandable vulnerability. Yeah. So no one wants to hear. I mean, bad about parents like he doesn't really know or don't know very well. Yeah. It's a big part of him. He still doesn't pull the grass. And then at the end of the book. He meets the person responsible for his parents' death more than anybody else. He has an opportunity right here, right now, right, to do something very final if he wanted to. And he doesn't. And the reason why is it is the most adult thing he does in the entire series. And it's just like that is and that's when that's when you, that's when I Harry in the first two books, he's cool, he's fun. But that's when Harry Potter became a real person to me. And I understand why that book in particular is why she blew up, because that is like that's what a good young adult fiction does. You put a young adult in a adult situation and you make them come face to face with some hard truths. What do you do with that? Who are you now with your actions? And that speaks volumes even to people no matter how old you are. It's how we handle situations that make us who we are. And so it, either people will say, I'm going to do something, I'm going to change, I'm going to accept this, or I'm not going to accept this, I'm going to fight this. I'm going, And sometimes one is a better answer than the other. Why did you go this way? What what was it? What was it? That's that's the real that's the real stuff. Yeah. Right. So young adult does that better than anybody else because in reading adult stuff, the emphasis is not necessarily if the character changes. Sometimes it is. Sometimes if you look at something like Jim Butcher's, um, oh man, I'm, I have literally blanked out here. Doesn't What? Doesn't pop? Yes. Yeah, no, I, I blanked. I'm a fan. I, I belong to the fan club. <laughs> I'm a Dresden follower. I, 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 don't hold this against me. I prefer Codex Alara. Oh, really? Yes. No. Yeah. Oh. And the, the reason I prefer... Okay, the reason tell me why, because I don't. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm saying, stop writing that crap and get back to the Dresden Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of resentful. No, 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 I enjoy it because it was in and out. I also like that it was a, it was a, I liked that the protagonist in that one was using his wits more than any, and then his power to get out of situations. He would, and I liked his characters. I liked all the characters around him. Yeah. So. What I liked about the Dresden Files is that, because you have this wizard, and he's a very powerful wizard, you know, but Witcher keeps putting limitations on his power, right? 
he always has limitations on his power. And he's always trying to do the most right thing, but he has to kind of take do it the wrong way or you know, it's just I like I like that dynamic. Because the most boring thing I find is somebody who has powers that can solve all problems. You know, what good is that? So I really enjoy that kind of limitation on his powers and how he struggles and yet he's always trying to do the right thing. Okay, I'm gonna shut up, because I'm totally I love it. No, 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 I'm just saying, but yeah. I, I, there's nothing wrong, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. The, that character, he grows throughout the series, too, and that, oh, that's yeah. a big, that's a big part of, yeah. of the, of, the uh, of him. Whereas, if you, but, like, but not every series focuses on that. Some are just very formulaic, some are very... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, so... Oh, yeah, I wouldn't, I mean, I don't argue with that, but I can live with it, because I would just love the series. Yeah. Well, like I said, I enjoyed the codex for what it was. It was a yeah. good entry point to reading him without committing to, like, at that point, 13 books. books. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want to do 13. Yeah. I don't know if I can do that. I, you like the in and out. With a slam down. Thank you, readers. Yeah, well... <laughs> Unless I really like you, then I just read everything. But I mean, I said, but I mean, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care if you wrote 450 books, Isaac Asimov. Let's go. <laughs> and that's how that's how, that's what he wrote. 450 books. So. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, so Miss Liz, yeah. I think I think we have an interview. I think. Do you think? You think I really I, enjoyed it. Yeah. You're such an interesting person. I, I, I hope that's a good thing. I oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I always said to my kids, um, I never wanted. I want. I said, be passionate. About it. I said, that's all I want to see in you is passion. I mean, of course you want good marks. Of course you want, you know, them to accomplish things. But the worst thing to see in life is someone who's kind of dead inside. I just, I love passionate people. I love people who are excited about things. That's, that's what I like. Well, that's the, a quality of people. Really, really good. Well, it's so rare. Yeah. Um, because it's... It's easy to get caught in your boxes. I work at a day, I work at a warehouse in a day job. I see people caught in their boxes all the time. Do you know what I did yesterday, the most important thing I did yesterday at my day job? I named a power jack from Hilda. That's a great name. Man, that's a fantastic name. Perfectly provoked. Yes. I did because because he, I have, there's these two employees who literally squabble over getting on the power jack. And they actually squabble with each other, which is hilarious. So, making fun of the fact that they are about five years old. <laughs> right, yeah, 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 right. I decided to name the power jack Brumhilda. And I was going to do an like, ode to Brumhilda. And that's what I did for like the first hour I was there while I was throwing non coms which are things over 60, 70 pounds, because that's not important. But the ode to Brumhilda was very important. And and uh, I made I made uh, a couple of the people there laugh their ass off. So I go, went to a couple. So do you think Brumhilda is a good power jack name? So I uh, university was, yeah, that's a good name. So just think about when those two fight, just think O2 Brumhilda. <laughs> the things I do to amuse myself at my day job. But that but the thing is, I, I appreciate the fact that at this point, and I, I honestly get this feeling, I know I'm not going to be there forever. I think, my, I, think I'm, I have more days behind me than in front of me there. And so while I'm still there, I am just, you know, I'm just enjoying the ride. I'm enjoying everything else I'm doing around it, doing what I have to do there. And, you know, and I keep my passion. I keep my work up. And because I know at the end of the day, I'm going to get what I want. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's really great. And you know what? That kind of job is really great for a creative person in a way. Because while it might tax you physically, yeah. the brain, you know, when you come home, you can yeah. get that process going, right? And it doesn't drain you mentally. No. And doesn't. so it's kind of a perfect hand in hand job with a yeah. creative kind of endeavors. So yeah, I, mean, I think I, you're making that work. Yeah, yeah. So slowly but surely. Yeah. So, so it's really nice to meet you. Yeah, it was really, really, really nice. So, so this yeah. is what we're going to do. Okay. Plug your current book. Oh, okay. And, and how people can find you. Okay. Well, um, I have a website, uh, www.elizabethwitten.com. My book, Houses of the Old Blood, is a, um, a young adult sort of urban sci-fi fantasy. It's about a 
sort of, it kind of sounds tropey, but basically what I've done is I've pretty well twisted every trope, uh, put it in the book, but it's about this, um, this young girl who um, discovers she isn't really who she thinks she is, and she's sort of plunged into, basically she's a member of another race, and she's plunged into a world of two distinct societies, um, where one society is basically a paramilitary, uh, paramilitary sort of metocracy, and another is um, sort of a hierarchical society based on um, blood prejudices, blood purity, blood purity. And she has to sort of navigate her way in these worlds and find a way to keep her human family safe. And it's all about her. And I think what I really love about this book, it's, um, it's basically uh, she does have a growth heart. And uh, she has a lot of, there's a lot of deep family secrets. And she learns a lot about herself. But one great thing about this book, it's really jam-packed with um, female role models. And people, women in this book have power and also responsibility. Anyway, and it's, there's people along the way who will help her and they're ruthless people. But she has to find her way, figure out who she is. And she also has to figure out how to save the ones she loves. And it's, um, it's a journey. And it was a really fun book. And it's, yeah, it has action. And she's, she gets to be a member of a cool fighting quad. It's got stuff. It's got stuff. Yes, sir. But um, a lot of people, I get good feedback from people about it. And the compliment I get that I love getting is the one, you know, that they can't put it down, that it's immersive. And um, that's, that's the uh, feedback I'm getting. So if you're interested in that kind of that kind of book, I think you would enjoy that book. And then I'm also for, uh, you were writing them up for a short story. Oh, which one? Um, the uh, Colony. And then it's about a vampire, or a dentist to the vampires. Dentist so to the vampires. Kind of like a true blood, kind of. Orthodontic book. Uh, <laughs> two rub with orthodontics. Yeah, with orthodontics. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, I think so. That was Elizabeth Wooden, and her book's awesome. You should definitely check it out. Now we gotta get to me. And uh, I'm still smiling, man. It feels so fantastic. Right now, I am looking at my own Aurora Award. Like, like it's unbelievable to me. Um, that I am looking at, yeah, I might tear up a little bit, so if I do, just, yeah, um, I never expected my name to be called up there, um, I, Sam Biko, I mean, could have very easily won all the awards she was nominated for, she's an amazing artist, writer, and very good podcaster in her own right, her and Claire have a great show, um, you know, um, the music, the CD, which I'm cracking, shaking, not stirred. Really, actually, good. The the cheesing series in Toronto was is definitely respectable. I didn't. I thought one of them was going to win it. I mean, you, I thought I was good enough to win it, but I didn't expect it. I think the thing that really amazes me. I still remember this, like Chris lies. The first person to smile at me was Hayden Trenholm. Like he, he had this big grin on his face, and I, I had this like, because I think, I think he got a kick out of how shocked I was, uh, winning it for the first time, and hopefully it will not be the last time. Uh, but the genuine smiles from like a lot of people, Brent Nichols, Calvin Jim, uh, Liz Trenholm gave me a hug. Joe Brent was the first person to congratulate me on the, on the phone. And I was like on, on Facebook, the the app, and I know I'm coming in a little jumble here. Uh, I got to talk to Fonda that night, and we, because we both won uh, won awards, and Fon and the ironically is my next guest on the show. It's just, it was an incredible moment. It really, really was. I I threw it. I had it. I didn't write like a full formal speech. I, I'm comfortable being up there speaking. I'm not. There isn't much I'm afraid of anymore in terms of that. I, every embarrassing moment that could happen to me in front of an audience kind of has. So I'm not worried about that anymore. Um. So I had a base base thank you stuff in mind, but I gotta say, um. You know, I had this moment, this epiphany, literally on um, Friday afternoon, that you know I kind of live a very magical life. And I do. I get this opportunity every time I do a podcast to tell a story or be part of a story that's amazingly going on. And it doesn't matter who my guest is, they're all doing incredible things. 
and uh, I to be recognized for what I'm doing by my peers. I mean, it's humbling, and the thank yous I've received. Uh, I th my high school thanks, I think, are the ones that impressed me the most. Um, it's cool to see some people I don't talk to on a regular basis anymore. Just got that one person in particular. I had a bit of a crush on her in high school. Uh, she goes, oh, wow, congrats. And if you know, you listen to me. Yeah, I, I had a crush on you. I think you knew. But if you don't, I did. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was incredible. Uh, yeah, like, it's stunning. I'm still... It, I'm never, I'm never going to fully, I think, I keep going because, I mean, I got here because of what I did and I have to keep going and doing, but I mean, just, I can't help but smile, man. I, I live a very, very blessed life with the people I meet and the people I interact with and honestly, to every single person who thanked me, everyone, like everybody, um, thank you very, very much. There's actually a bit of a tear that come in my eye right now, so I better wrap this up so I can go you know, cry like a baby in the corner somewhere. But, uh, no, thank you everyone for listening to the show. Um, whether, however you do it, whether it's through iTunes, through Podomatic, whether it's you well, catch a link on my Facebook or Twitter, whether or not um, you subscribe to the show, whether you, like, thank you. So, to support the show, you can do a number of different things. Right now, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can buy my books, The Watcher, Storm, and the Wandering God, through MirrorWorldBooksPublishing.com. You can, my YouTube channel is Joshua Pentelaresco. You can check out my stuff there. Whatever you do, I really do hope you stay inspired. Good things happen to those that do good and that work hard at it. And, I mean, I got, I did it. And if I can do it, you can. And really, I hope that's what you get out of there. So see you next time. Josh. Josh.